We are in the second part of chapter 8, Unearthing Secrets. This will probably be in three parts because it's a long chapter. Pigeon placed his palms on the top of the wall like the others had, but could not boost himself high enough to get the upper half of his body draped over the top. He couldn't kick a leg high enough to hook his foot up there either. He just kept hopping and panting and scratching up his forearm. He felt embarrassed when Trevor climbed back over and helped him get on top of the relatively low barrier. Pigeon dropped to the grass on the far side, and Trevor landed beside him a moment later. This place is scary at night, Nate said, running his hand along the top of a worn old headstone. In the buttery glow of the rising moon, the fading inscription was legible. This person died in 1906. Just about everybody alive now hadn't even been born yet. There were a lot of old graves, Trevor said, especially on this side of the graveyard, Nate said. They still have empty land way over that way. He waved a hand in the direction he meant. The gravestones are more recent over there. Where's Hanover, Summer asked. Nate looked around. Mom and I came in through the front, so I'm a little turned around. Follow me. He started weaving among the shadowy tombstones until he reached a narrow paved road. They continued along the road to an intersection. Nate paused, looking around. I know where we are now, Nate said confidently. I remember that tomb with the angels. He took the road that curved up a gentle slope. As they rounded the bend, Nate started trotting. There it is, he said, pointing. The tomb for Hanover Mills was as tall as Pigeon and wider than it was tall. It looked old, but his name remained deeply inscribed in commanding letters. Beneath his name were the years 1821 to 1893, along with the words, Father, Inventor, Philanthropist. What's a philanthropist, Trevor asked. It means he donated monies to charities, Pigeon said. Around the back of the tombstone stood the 49er, looking creepier in the darkness than he had under the sun. Did you find Margaret Spencer, Summer asked. I, look around a bit. I looked around a bit, but didn't see her, Nate said. I figured eight eyes would be better than two. I didn't want to ask anybody from the cemetery since we really shouldn't be here at night. They fanned out. A few minutes later, Summer called out down the slope and farther down the road. The others hurried over. Margaret Spencer had a more modest traditional tombstone, about waist high, narrow with a rounded top. The inscription had almost weathered away, and a few thin cracks zigzagged across the surface. Her name and the year she lived were barely legible, meaning barely readable. Good eyes, Nate said. Let's go get the 49er. Nate and Trevor returned to Hanover's headstone and lugged the wooden miner down to the gravesite. Should we take the melting pot mixers now? Pigeon asked. Maybe we should wait until we get more of a hole dug. It might take a while, and the mixers only last an hour. She should have given us more than one each, Trevor complained. We definitely want them on the way home, Nate said. I think we should wait. If somebody comes, we can take them quickly. Except you, Trevor said. You'll be unconscious. Good point, Nate said. I better take mine now, just in case. Summer unzipped a pocket of her jacket and gave Nate the little ball of chocolate. She passed the melting pot mixers to Trevor and Pigeon as well, so they would have one if they needed it. Nate ate his, and after a moment, started convulsing, doubled over, and when he stood up, he looked like a full-blooded Native American. You guys be lookouts, Nate said. I want Trevor to stay it's by me while I dig, stay low. With that moon, people could see us from the road. I want to do the cool part this time, Summer said, not keep watch. Mrs. White said, I'm supposed to work the miner, Nate reminded her. Not digging, that's no fun either. I want to get the box. Be my guest, Nate said. We'll call you when we're there. Summer, you watch the little road and pigeon. You watch the main one. If you see trouble, hoot like an owl. I'm not sure that would fool anybody, Summer said. Just make sure, make that signal if you need one, Nate replied. We don't need something as piercing as a whistle. Nate and Trevor huddled into the shadow of the largest tombstone close to the Margaret Spencer gravestone. Summer moved into the direction of the little cemetery road and squatted behind an eight-foot obelisk. Pigeon snuck down the slope toward Saddle Road, taking up position behind a wooden supply shed. Before long, Pigeon heard the sounds of a shovel digging earth along the, with the occasional scrape of metal against stone. The sounds were so quick they could have come from multiple shovels, but he never actually heard two at once, and Pigeon knew the only digging tools they had were the shovel and the pickaxe of the 49er. Pigeon watched the field of tombstones before him, him the wall and the dark road beyond. The rhythmic sounds of digging became hypnotic, but the tension of possible discovery and the eeriness of the setting helped keep him alert. As time passed, he recited the U.S. presidents to himself, first in the order in which they held office, then alphabetically. Pigeon was starting on vice presidents when he saw a car cruising slowly along Saddle Road. 
the headlights messing up his night vision. Crawling so that the shed was between him and the road, Pigeon hooted. The sounds of shoveling had already ceased. Pigeon leaned out, peeking out around the side of the shed with half his face. The car had stopped. He was almost certain that it was a police car. Suddenly, a bright light glared in his eyes. Pigeon hid his head behind the shed, a bright beam of light sweeping the area. You, behind the shed, crackled an electronically magnified voice. Come out with your hands in the air. The beam of light returned to the shed. Pigeon popped the ball of chocolate into his mouth, and a moment later his flesh began to ripple. I saw you come out from behind the shed. Don't make me come in after you. Go, Pigeon heard a voice urge from up the slope. The rippling had subsided, leaving Pigeon looking different. He stuck a sweet tooth in his mouth and stepped out from behind the shed. Hands held high. I'm just a kid, a kid Pigeon yelled. Keep your hands where I can see them and walk slowly to me, the police officer instructed. Pigeon complied. It was a long walk. The spotlight stayed in his eyes the entire time. When Pigeon reached the wall, he could see the police officer, a muscular man with short hair and chiseled cheekbones. The officer turned off the spotlight and approached Pigeon, holding a bright flashlight. You aren't allowed to be here after hours, the police officer told him. I have special permission, Pigeon said. The sweet tooth nestled under his tongue. Remember that that sweet tooth lets him tell stories and people will believe them. Special permission, the police officer repeated in a tone that implied that that was unlikely. The only lie Pigeon could think of sounded pretty lame, but he had to say something. I'm doing a service project for the Cub Scouts, weeding. Little late for weeding, isn't it? The policeman said. I have school and my dad works odd hours, Pigeon said. This was the best time. The cemetery people know about it. I have to do this to get my arrow of light. The police officer stared at him. You know, as a kid, I always wanted to be a Cub Scout, the man said, but never really knew how to join. Please don't report this or tell anybody, Pigeon said. If they hear from the police, the cemetery people might back out of sponsoring my project. The police officer winked. I think we can keep this one off the record. Keep up the good work. Don't stay out too late. Thank you for being so understanding, Pigeon said. Might not be worth remembering this ever happened. Might not, the police officer turned, got in his car, and drove off down the road. Feeling traumatized but relieved, Pigeon retreated to the shed. The noise of digging had already resumed. What did you tell him? Summer said. I said I was doing a Cub Scout project. He bought that, she exclaimed. Pretty easily, Pigeon said. I was worried at first, but then he just accepted it. Summer started um, started waving her hands. I, I don't want to waste it. I should keep it, she said as she took a melting pot mixture out of her hand, out of her mouth. You ought to hurry back to your post, Pigeon suggested. Okay, Summer said. Good job. Crouching, she dashed up the slope and Pigeon grinned. That is a break in the chapter, and I will read the next part next time.